Okay, um, hello again to everyone if you're still with us and welcome to those who are just joining. This is our second presentation of our panel series, The Resilient Professor Approaches to Overcoming Online Teaching Burnout. Our next presenter is Dr. Nathan Pritz, Professor and Lead Faculty with Ashford University. Nate's presentation is titled, How to Run Your Classroom So It Doesn't Run You. Microphones will be muted for this presentation, but we encourage you to post questions and comments in the chat. Also keep an eye on the chat for a link to a helpful session feedback survey. And now I'm pleased to prevent, present Dr. Nathan Fritz. Thanks, Connie. Thank you all for coming, Connie. I didn't hear if you had started the recording, so I'm just uh, mentioning that. I really appreciate you guys taking the time to come to this today. Uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about how to run your classroom so it doesn't run you, but there's one thing that I want you to keep in mind. Um, when we say teaching, whether it's online teaching or ground-based teaching, uh, there are a lot of different things we could mean. And I guess I kind of want you to sort of think what you think teaching is. Um, it's not a quiz, I'm not gonna necessarily ask you, but sort of keep it in mind for you, what is, what is your teaching? Uh, because I, it occurs to me that I'm gonna be talking about two very different types of teaching uh, over the course of this presentation. A couple of things I'm going to talk about. I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about how we all get buried uh, by the different tasks that pile up. I want to think about how that is a tactically flawed problem that we're going to try to figure out different ways around. Uh, winter is going to provide a key that's going to help us to understand how to get past that. And as with everything, we are stronger together. And at the end, I hope to have some time for questions, answers, discussions. I'll at least be able to share uh, some resources with you. Here's me, I'm Dr. Nate Pritz. Thank you again for coming. I teach here at Ashford University in the Center for the Enhancement of the First Year Experience. Uh, back in June, I gave a quick presentation about how to plan and record audio content in online classes. I got a lot of feedback on that session. People seemed really excited about the possibilities of using audio to engage student learners, uh, to empower them to interact with course content wherever and however and whenever they want. Instructors told me that they were inspired to test out the ideas I had shared. And so that's, that's pretty awesome. But there was other feedback too. And it went something like this. Sure, that's a nice idea, but when am I gonna have time to do that? Uh, now, I had made it clear in my presentation that my path had taken a couple of months of research and planning, of grit and work, of failure after failure after failure, all shoehorned in between my real duties and responsibilities. Basically, this was all time stolen from other pursuits. But even though I had packed my presentation with tools and resources and tried to clearly operationalize all the takeaways, there was still a big hole. How are we, how are any of us supposed to find the time to do this stuff? The best, best practice stuff, that advanced expert mastery magic. How are we gonna find time to level that class up? It's all we can manage to teach mindfully in the online modality. So how can we also be expected to find the time necessary to optimize the learning experience to both iterate and innovate within the online classroom? So this presentation is my attempt at an answer. It's not the answer and it might not be your answer. Uh, faculty workload is one of those elephants in the room. It blends in with the furniture so well. Uh, it's been there for so long. Uh, but I figured I would take a shot at wrangling the elephant by the trunk or the tusks, uh, describe it a little better maybe than it had been before. I'm gonna really quickly drop a link into the chat this will take you to a site where you can download my slides if you're interested in following along, uh, if you're having trouble seeing the screen. Uh, and there's some other resources and information there as well. When we talk about faculty workload management in the online classroom, there's a lot of uh, focus on ways to better manage the tasks that pop up from day to day. Uh, quicker grading, faster discussion responses. But this kind of operational work is by definition ongoing. There is no end to it. So maybe you can increase task-based efficiency, but you'll never truly tunnel through to the other side. And then there are all the productivity gurus with enough books and blog posts to bury that elephant that tell you to turn the lens back on you. 
They want you to hack your way to machine-like efficiency in your habits and pro processes. They want you to get better at managing your daily workflow, dealing with all the digital sediment that piles up and blocks our ability to get deeper, to think our way through the classroom with a wider scope, to kind of get through teaching to teaching if you'll allow me to make an analogy like that. The problem is that both of these methods are wrong, or at least they're incomplete. Uh, they present tactical solutions to tactical problems. I mentioned digital sediment earlier, those tasks and duties that are part and parcel of online teaching and which always threaten to bury us. To start digging out, I want to borrow a term from archeology, span overburden, that encapsulates this. Overburdened is how we feel, I know, but overburden, one word, in archaeological terms is all the soil, all the mud, the rock, and other materials that lie on top of what you're trying to get to in a dig. And our classes, our teaching, can easily be crushed under the weight of this overburden. What we have to realize is that we will never clear the decks, never fully eliminate the digital overburden. We can't, and we wouldn't want to actually, since that's where so much vital teaching and learning takes place. But what we can do is come up with a plan that equally prioritizes strategic thinking with those overwhelming tactical tasks. We can make a place for the overburden, shift it to the side, and reconfigure our mindset to prioritize innovation, green fields, and the bluest of blue skies. When we're teaching, we find ourselves running on parallel tracks. There's the largely operational and tactical work of day-to-day -day teaching and the proactive track of strategic thinking that at its best embraces a wider scope of ideation and innovation in our teaching and in the classroom itself. But the reality is that we're so often busy grading assignments that we don't have time to think of ways to make those assignments better. In my work training and mentoring online faculty, what I hear over and over again is a desire to push through the pileup of tasks to get into that strategic space where true innovation is possible. That's where we can burst through to deeper insights about how we spend our time in the classroom, how we connect with students and create more meaningful experiences. But managing that overburden of daily teaching, the blinking red lights on the mission control dashboard, doesn't seem to leave us with any time or energy left to put into moonshot thinking or innovative development. It's tempting to believe we can save time and preserve our good energy by getting faster at the tactical stuff in the classroom. For example, sometimes there really is a simple tool that can be leveraged to save time when you're grading. For example, do you know that you can create a commentary library in Waypoint or on a separate spreadsheet that allows you to pre-fill some of your most frequent comments with just a few keystrokes? It's true. Uh, and sometimes there is a more pedagogical path to efficiency. Uh, for example, marking every single typo in a student paper is probably not the best way to use your time or to actually reach the student. So those are two things you can correct, but this incremental approach is likely to plateau before long. Sure, maybe you can save a few minutes here and there while grading, but you need more than minutes to really change your perspective. So then we can always consider that there might be more efficient work habits we can embrace more generally in our lives. That is, if we can't hack the task, maybe we can hack ourselves. I know many people turn to all kinds of productivity systems and hacks to manage their work. I've tried a lot of them myself, uh, from Pomodoro, which seeks to manage focus, to Kanban, which is a powerful tool for visualizing workflow. I'm not knocking any of these systems or their adherence, uh, and diving under the hood of what these and other systems are trying to regulate can yield some really profound and actionable insights without the trendy names and hollow promises. So sure, traditional time management strategies might be able to help with creating a quicker response stream in the tactical area of our teaching. But what these and so many other systems try to manage are your work habits to hack your productivity and get you to work more efficiently. But that's where it falls apart for me. Teaching doesn't break into neat segments or discrete tasks. And I'm not sure if efficient is the number one word people want to use to describe themselves as teacher. Inspiring, creative, awesome not efficient. So I don't think 
that that's what we should be aiming for. And I don't think you are the problem. I don't think the barrier to faculty workload management in the online classroom is faculty. It's the classroom itself. It's baked into the DNA of the modality. And it's not something we can overcome. The sooner we accept that, the better. So where does that leave us? There comes a point past which we can't increase productivity any further. A point from which we can't decrease workload and cognitive burnout anymore. So how do we break the cycle? Whenever I need a little clarity, I take a look outside my window. Uh, literally, it's snowing right now. Or maybe I turn to some poetry. If you're familiar with Wallace Stevens as a poet, clarity is probably not the quality you associate with his writing. But trust me, I find that his work usually helps distill the difficult in a way that provides greater insights. I'm not going to read this entire poem, The Snowman. It's easy enough to find online if you're interested. People, a lot of people know the first line, which is, one must have a mind of winter. But, but what does that mean? And here's the last stanza, because this is what was echoing in my mind while I was working on this presentation and, and digging into this concept of overburden and how that can apply to the work we do in the online classroom. For the listener who listens in the snow and nothing himself beholds nothing that is not there and the nothing that is. This really inspires me to empty myself out, to become nothing. So that when I think about workflow in the classroom, I don't have preconceptions clogging the view. I can see truly what's there instead of what's not there. And I can also acknowledge all the nothing that is there. A mind of winter for me and maybe for you is a refresh, a reset. And of course, it's, it's much more complex than that. And I can't do justice to it in just a couple of minutes here. But you know, uh, our old friend Wallace Stevens was a business executive. So I think he'd understand that I'm kind of glossing over the rewarding complexities of this work. Stevens helps me cleanse and get ready for reconceptualizing a strategic mindset in the classroom. Because in some ways, there is a huge flawed premise at work here. It says that once we complete the tasks cluttering up the tactical field of the online classroom, we can then progress to the wide open innovative space of strategic planning. The flaw is that we can't ever complete the tasks that pile up. So uh, if we can't finish one to get to the other, we're going to have to find a way to do both. There are always more papers to grade. There's more emails to write or respond to. So what I suggest is that we stop thinking of these two domains as hierarchical or that you have to complete one before progressing to the other. It's easy to put things off in the face of the vast dailiness of the world, but we need to prioritize strategic thinking, be proactive in how we embrace innovation and change action in the classroom. Establishing a productive workflow for online faculty and engineering a more efficient workload are not necessarily destinations. I think we should always be chasing solutions always scrutinizing and evaluating ways to work smarter in service of our students. But in order to do that, I think we need to take a fundamental step back, realign our priorities in the classroom, and approach the entire predicament with a fresh mindset. We tell our students that the classroom is a place where active learning happens and not to view it as simply a task list or boxes to check off. We ask them to be open to a process that can spark deep insights if they engage fully with it, and these are lessons we need to remember as instructors ourselves. Teaching a class is a dynamic and iterative process. When we begin a new class, we might first think about building it, but while it's important to create an educational architecture to support the learning in the class, we shouldn't think of any aspect of the process as static. Any material we place in the classroom, whether it's part of that initial building phase or developed in the moment as we need it, should be scrutinized, developed, redeveloped, changed situation, situationally, uh, and it should be growing and it should be uh, outgrown and done again. I know it seems like that's gonna lead to more work. Uh, I'm not suggesting that you touch every aspect of the classroom on every single day. In fact, if we think of classroom teaching as iterative in nature, I'm not even suggesting that you touch every aspect of the classroom every week or even every time you are assigned to teach a new course section. An iterative mindset allows you to embrace context switching in the classroom. I wish I could say that this process is a neat one, or that it falls naturally into digestible chunks. It would be nice if, for example, the operational work and our teaching took place only on Mondays. 
um, or that we could reserve Tuesdays and Thursdays for research and nothing else could, could touch us or penetrate. Um, but that's not how it works. Though in actuality, what I'm suggesting isn't really far off from that. Think for a second about what you did on Monday. Think of what you had to do on Monday. And then think about if you've ever done Monday tasks on a different day. I'm gonna to try to take something that for me is largely intuitive and talk about it like it's a program. But the first step here is really to understand that work, to think about what happens on Monday, whatever it is, uh, though for our purposes, we're talking about teaching, working with students. Uh, it, this could be expanded to other aspects of your life as well. I'd like you to think about those things that you do toward this goal. Think about the tasks you must do every day, stuff like checking your email. And then think about the things you do less frequently, but still regularly, like working on the discussion board or grading. Eventually, you can start to sort things into categories marked by those required frequencies. So again, this is personal and intuitive, but I can share with you generally that my listing might look something like this. I intentionally check my email twice a day. I do it a lot more frequently than that, but only during my downtimes. And I set particular times when I sit there and actually check and do all my email work. And I do discussion board work only on Thursday, Friday, and Monday, and only for a set block of time. If you uh, are here at Ashford teaching, you know that one of the requirements is that you're active on the discussion board three days a week. Those are my three days, Thursday, Friday, and Monday. I want you to think about all those things that you spend time doing on this slightly more granular time scale. I want you to put that to the side. I want you to put it in a box in the back of the room and set particular times to open that box. The rest of the time, I want you to completely forget that box is even there. What we're doing in some ways is regimenting our attention. In cognitive science, attention refers to all the mechanisms by which the brain selects information, amplifies it, channels it, and deepens, it process, deepens its processing. I'm using a definition from the book, How We Learn by Stanislas Stehain. Here it is right here. If you're looking at my face, you can see it's now covered up with this book. Partly because uh, it was his writing on attention that helped me to understand the deep insight behind the idea that the art of paying attention also includes the art of not paying attention. In short, what that means to me is that if I'm spending time Thursday thinking about and working in the discussion board, then I am spending the entire rest of that day not thinking about that work. And more broadly, if discussion board work takes place on three different days, then there are four days that week when I am not thinking about it at all. I don't click into it, I don't access it, I don't even let those words cross my mind. There's a mechanism at work here, uh, and Dehane points it out, which is called biased competition, which is the dynamic at work when the selected signal is amplified, but then also dramatically reduces those other signals that are deemed irrelevant even if only temporarily so. So on Thursdays around three o'clock in the afternoon, my selected signal is discussion board work. Everything else is muted in the background, dropped out of the spotlight, but then the spotlight moves. And I try not to think about those things that are waiting out there in the dark. Harrison Harnish Buffer helps make the point that there is a huge amount of context that needs to be formed in your mind before you can start solving problems. Building context can take hours, but can be lost immediately, second by second, through random interruption. So on one level, what I'm talking about is related to context switching, jumping from one type of task to another, discussion board, three o'clock on Thursday, and then never again until the next time. Um, Context switching, of course, can get a bad rap and seems reminiscent of multitasking. And I think by now we all know that multitasking is bad and doesn't really work, um, at least doesn't work for the kind of deeply entangled knowledge work that we do as educators. I'm arguing in favor of something that's more akin to context blocks, little preserves that you build in your mind with context and creativity packed in. This was a crucial insight for me, a key to developing this whole process. I used to be incredibly responsive in the classroom. Well, responsive sounds like a positive thing. Uh, better to characterize it as twitchy. I was in the discussion board every day, scrolling and reading. I was grading every day. 
But once I realized that I could choose to pay attention to certain things, to bring my whole self to them for set and particular periods of time, that left other times when I could bring my whole self to other things, projects, ideas, dinner. Uh, so now I grade discussions on Tuesdays and only on Tuesdays, which means later that day, if there's time, I can do something else, anything else. I can talk to you guys here at a TLC presentation. But all the rest of the days of the week that aren't Tuesday, I never grade discussions. I don't even look at them. I can pull my head up from the day-to-day -day operational tasks like discussions or grades and dedicate time to even some small amount of projects that might not pay off today or tomorrow or even next month. In fact, these projects might never pay off at all. Uh, but failure is an important part of my process, messing things up. And I need the time to make mistakes. When I first started teaching online, I was given some sample lecture materials to post in my very first online class, and I did it, but I only posted for week one and two and five. I set the intention of writing my own lecture materials for week three and four, a little at a time, bit by bit. When I taught the class again, I was able to reuse those week three and week four materials, but then write my own materials for the weeks that I had skipped before, week one, two, and five. On the next go around, I could spruce up week three and four, I could add audio, I could add video. This kind of iterative and incremental process is what's allowed me to make some of these, what seem like larger changes in the classroom or in my life overall, uh, but to make them slowly and steadily around the other sort of furniture in the room. Once we imagine, reimagine the cycle of incremental progress that fuels the online classroom, once we manage and deploy our thinking on larger ideas about our online teaching, we can open a window. And this window shows us a wider scope of iteration and innovation in our teaching and in the classroom itself. I can't imagine the kinds of innovation that are possible when we stop thinking with our fingers when we don't just do what we think. I can't imagine what I can't yet imagine, but I can imagine a plan that helps me get there. Here are a few resources. There's the Stanislaus Dehain book that I was talking about, a couple of links that'll take you to some articles that I found really helpful, as well as a couple of links back to my own site, one of which will lead you to the audio presentation I was mentioning earlier, and the other which is the link to the presentation today. I wanted to share a particular method with you. Um, it's not what I did, it's not how I did it, but it seemed to boil down pretty clearly uh, the different steps I'm describing. It might be helpful when thinking about your own sense of this schedule. So I'm going to drop this link in the chat again. Um, when you get there, you, you'll see not only this PowerPoint that you could download, but there's also a couple of templates there that will help you uh, kind of reconceptualize your own schedule, your own plan, your own workflow. Uh, to try to get it uh, organized in a way that's going to work for you and, and hopefully clear some space for you. And now, I have no idea what time it is, but potentially there's a couple minutes for questions or answers, Connie. Yes, there is. Um, and Nate, do you mind if I add to your resources? No, go ahead. To buttress what Nate has been telling us about um, and his um, his strategies and his philosophy. There's another book that's more informal than some of the resources I think Nate presented, but it's called The One Thing by um, Gary Keller with Jay Papasan. And it speaks to the same type of um, strategy that Nate's been telling us about. Um, so that's something else you can look for that may help you. Cool. I'm always learning and, and learning more about this stuff. I mean, and there are so many, I feel like I could have packed this entire presentation with just hacks and tips and tricks, but you know, the thing is some of these only work for some people some of the time. And once I started to kind of gather more and more of these uh, ideas, these hacks, I realized that really the hacks can only get you so far. And it, it really is more of a mindset shift. And, and you know, I don't, I don't know that any of this resonates. It seems like people, like this, but it, it doesn't always resonate with everybody and it doesn't always resonate every day for everything, but hopefully this kind of gets us to a point where teaching is not just grading and responding to emails, but teaching is again that moment where we're standing with a blank computer in front of us or a blank classroom, an open classroom, and we can have these amazing ideas for how to convey our course content. We forget to do that sometimes, uh, and so I want us to all be able to get back there. 
I am placing the link for the feedback survey in the chat so you can all um, prepare that. It won't take more than 30 seconds to do. If you would uh, like to do that now, that would be great. And if you have a question, um, please post it in the chat and um, we have a minute or two that Nate can address it. My number one hack is to read more Wallace Stevens. <laughs>